to see you this morning. Great to be in the house of God. How many love being here? Isn't it? Isn't our church just worship and just the people and community is so amazing? I always uh, pinch myself that this is real life. I've been in full time ministry for I don't know 14, 15 or plus years or so, and I just this I love this community. I just want to say I love you all. Welcome home. Welcome to the family. Like Serge said, my name is Vic. I'm part of the senior leadership team here, and I get to be one of the, uh, the, the, the preachers, one of the teachers of the house. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is to, to break down the word of God. One of my favorite scriptures is John 8, 32, that you will know the truth, and the truth will? Set you free. That's right. Truth sets you free. But it's not truth that sets you free. It's truth that you know. So what you don't know can't set you free. So... I love to break down truth. Uh, part of Kingdom Movement, we actually, you know, we have another branch of equipping called Kingdom Movement School of Ministry. That's our Bible school. That's our, our, our school of ministry. So if you even want to go deeper into the word, you know, maybe God is calling you, inviting you to dedicate a season of your life, take nine months and uh, dive into our school of ministry and get equipped deeper into that. So I'm excited today uh, to talk about some great things in the word. Amen. You guys ready to go on a journey with me? All right, come on. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's time to grow up. (laughs) Turn to your other neighbor and say, I dare you to grow. Okay, perfect. Message today is on dare to grow. Dare to grow. Embracing the journey of spiritual growth. Oh man, time to grow. It's like, it's like going to the gym, you know, you hate it, but you love it. It hurts so good. You know, uh, I've, uh, I'm becoming a runner. Actually, I am a runner. Last year I started running, I am a runner. That's one of the things I've been working on saying, because if you just say like, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, working on doing a race, you'll never be a runner. But when you tell yourself you're a runner, then you can become a runner. So I'm a runner, I'm an author, you know, things that you want to do, you just got to just believe about yourself, amen? Um, but in running, I realized that sometimes, you know, uh, pain hits you and, you, you know, you're like, okay, like, I know I'm supposed to go on that two or three hour cycling ride today um, or on that, you know, quick 15 miler run, you know, whatever. Uh, and sometimes you don't look forward to, but you realize on the other side of just your consistent commitment is actually your growth. No one signs up to the gym or pays for a personal trainer and is like, you know what, just be really easy on me. Don't really tell me anything what to do. Just come in, let's just joke around and have fun. How many hire a personal trainer and then expect no results, little results, or no work, right? And so growth is always connected to the investment in work. And so uh, I wanna talk about this journey of growth because I think it's, uh, in the body of Christ, I think it's something super important to understand. I think there's some uh, theological concepts and thoughts about there out there that uh, inhibit growth. You know that you can actually believe lies. We call them limiting beliefs and they'll actually stop your growth. You know that you're designed and called by God to grow. As a, as a believer, you know, you're, you're born again. You're made like Jesus. In one moment, you know, uh, Jesus died on the cross and he said, it is finished. Amen? And so, and then, and, and then in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says this, that whoever's in Christ is a... New creation. They're a new creature. They're brand new. The old things have passed away. All things have become new. And so there seems to be in the Bible this tension where it's like already, but not yet. Anyone ever explore that tension? And depending on, you know, where you've been or where you've, you know, theologically thought, sometimes um, I have seen this like inhibiting growth factor called a limiting belief. And it's actually, it's actually not even a limiting belief. It's a false belief. But it's this idea that when you're born again, you are already perfect and you have already made it. You've already arrived and you have nothing else to grow. Like you can't sin. You, n- you don't need to grow up. You in one moment are made exactly like Jesus and you're already perfect. Anyone ever heard of that before? Okay, cool. I, I used to actually adopt a little mo- more closely to it. And then I just realized that um, that's not true. <laughs> Both through scripture and through just life, you know, and I'm not saying that we should ever dumb down scripture to our experience. No, 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 not at all. We never take our experience and then say, you know what, and then interpret it through the lens of scripture. We actually take scripture, which we'll do today, and we actually want to live up to what scripture tells us to do. You know, all of Christianity is a journey of growth. It's a call to growth. Everything in the Bible is written there to warn you, to correct you, to grow you, 
the whole entire thing is a journey of growth. How many know the day you're born again is not the day you arrive? <laughs> it's the day you begin. It's not the day you arrive. If it was the day you arrive, then it would be better for us to all be born again and then immediately vanish away into eternity, be caught up in the air because it is finished, right? So the work of Jesus on the cross is finished, but the work of Jesus in your life is be beginning to unto being finished because, you know, how many know that the Lord doesn't want to do something just for you? He wants to do it with you. God, as a good father... He doesn't want to do something for you. He actually wants to do it with you. He wants you to grow up. Why? Because God is a father and he's raising up sons on the earth that he has given dominion and authority and he wants to partner with. If God were just the one that were doing everything, then he would just not partner with us. But actually he wants to partner with us. The best revelation of God is God as a father, us as sons and wanting to mature. Uh, the Lord even actually gives us very practical ways on this earth for us to learn these very same principles. Like he allows us to become parents of children. And I'm a parent of a couple of children. I have a 10 year old and a two year old. And how many know that when your children are just born, they are fully dependent on you. Now they are finished as far as their DNA goes. They're exactly like you. Actually way before they're even born in the womb, their DNA comes from you, mom and dad together. And there, there is a there is a finished work of all of the mapping of the DNA of everything. It's fully, fully finished, but it's there in seed form. And how many know that that DNA, even though it's fully there, it's not gonna grow and develop and have more, but it's, what it's gonna do is it's gonna manifest what's finished inside of there, and it's gonna begin a process and a journey of growth. The reason why God doesn't actually uh, even, you know, give us children, how weird would it be if you, know, you gave birth to a child and it's like, bam, a full-grown you know, adult. How many ever watched the movie, you know, the, the Curious Case of Benjamin Button? Where he's like born and he like reverse ages. He starts from like 90 something. He's all this like, this baby, this like really old decrepit looking. And then like it's younger and younger and younger and younger. And then turns into a baby in his, in his old age. He, that's, that's weird, okay? That's why it's a curious case. Thank God that kids aren't born as like walking, talking, you know, like, you know, already talking back to you. I, I love the baby stage, you know what I mean? Uh, a, a wise person once told me this, that, you know, like, you know, parents, they're, you know, they're funny creatures. They spend the first two years of their baby's life trying to get them to walk and talk. And then they spend the rest of their life trying to get them to sit down and shut up, you know what I mean? <laughs> so you know what? We just need to enjoy the growth and development. That there's this thing in Christianity called already and not yet. <laughs> That even though it's finished on the seed level, the seed hasn't manifested to produce fruit. And so all of Christianity is a journey of manifesting what's been done on the inside. Jesus has finished the work. How do we manifest that work so that people around us can see it? Because it's, it's one thing to claim, you know, I'm like Jesus in every way, you know, I'm, I'm sin free, like nothing's wrong with me. But it's another thing for someone else to say that about you. It's not about what, you say about you, it's what you're actually manifesting to the world. What are they saying about you? Do they see Christ fully formed in you? Do they see you living like Jesus in every single way? Because that's our call. The Bible says this, that whoever claims to live in God must live like Jesus. That's the bar. But we start as a seed and we must grow. And so all of Christianity is a journey of growth. That's why you're in community. <laughs> that's why you're in family. That's why we are with the Lord. I mean, it's, it's, it's more than that. It's not, it's not just unto growth. I mean, it's not so shallow. We, we don't do something unto just our own personal growth. But one of the reasons why God's planted you in a community in really healthy soil called church and family and community and life groups and openness is because he wants you to grow. So turn to your neighbor again and say, dare to grow. Okay, that was the introduction. Okay, sounds good. Let's do this. So I'm gonna, I wanna look at this tension in scripture and I wanna look at, instances where the Bible seems to contradict itself and there's a tension there and uh, we're going to discover you know what's true here so you know uh, some people when it comes to the word sanctification anyone ever heard of the word sanctification you know it's a, just a it's just a biblical word uh, there's justification sanctification there's glorification you know if you're in the catholic church there's transubstantiation you know we won't get into all the shuns it doesn't really matter um sanctification is just a way to say two things. I mean, in scripture, when you see the word sanctification, uh, you, it's basically, there's three kind of central definitions to, I'll just really quickly say, but it means to make something holy 
or to set something apart, like you consecrate it and dedicate it to the Lord. Like if I were to say this, like, Lord, you know, this water bottle is for you. I set it apart. I dedicate it to you. I sanctify it unto you. It means to be set apart and also to make something holy. Let's say this water bottle is unholy. Like say in here, there's a microscopic amount of like fecal matter. And if I were to make it holy, I could, you know, go in there microscopically, remove it, zap it, whatever, and make it holy again, you know? So that would be to sanctify it. And then to purify and cleanse, a very similar concept there. But to make holy, to purify, to cleanse, that's one side of sanctification. The other side is to set apart. Okay, so sanctification simply means that when we refer to sanctification in Christianity, we're typically talking about this. <laughs> It's the journey of growth to manifesting what's already been done on the inside of us. So it's been given to us in seed form, but we have to grow up. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's time to grow up. Hey, I've enjoyed the baby stage, but I don't want you to baby your whole life. You know, how weird would it be if my two-year-old always acted like a two-year-old 15 years from now? You know, and I might have a 10-year-old that still does that. So you know what? This message is for her. Time to grow up. Okay, just kidding. Good thing she's not here. She's tuning on, I love you. Oh, she is right here. Oh, she's right here. Moving briskly on. Just kidding. And maybe this is why there's been a growth inhibitor, you know? All that encouragement. We'll talk about in in inhibitors to growth in a minute here, but uh, sanctification in the Bible is, uh, let's look at the tension of it. Let's take a look at Hebrews. Uh, have you ever wondered, like, is sanctification instant or a process? Go to that slide there. Is sanctification, is it instant? Are we instantly set apart? Are we instantly made holy? Are we instantly cleansed? Or is it a process? Actually, this is before this. If you go back, right there. Is it instant or a process? Have we already died to sin or are we still in a process of dying? Where you stand theologically on this actually will determine whether you grow or not. Because if it's already finished for you, you're not growing anywhere. But if you're in a process and then you embrace the journey, oh, it's gonna be awesome. So is sanctification right away? Is it a process or is it a future act? Actually in scripture, and uh, in my notes, I think I have like, I don't know, it's a, lot, it's a lot of notes. It's like 20, 30 pages. I'm only gonna cover just a few highlights. But you'll be able to download them. They're gonna be uploaded online in our like kingdommovement.com. You go over to media and then you can download the notes. It's called Dare to Grow. And I'll give you all my notes. Do this study. There's like tons and tons of scriptures. And I, I look at all the scriptures of it being done, being a process, and being future. And then I look at, you know, death. Is it past tense or is it ongoing? Have you wondered that? Because in scripture, we see both. Let's take a look real quickly just at a couple of them. Let's build this tension. Hebrews 10.10 10 says this. By this will, God's will, we've been sanctified. Say, I've been sanctified. Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. So Jesus' body was sacrificed once for all. And by that sacrifice, we have been sanctified. So we're sanctified by the blood and body of Jesus Christ. Once for all. That seems like a pretty finished work. Like, because sanctification instant, I think so. Hebrews 10, 10. Come on, man. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 11. Such were some of you. Paul lists a whole list of sins. And he's like, such were some of you, these sins. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. So the name of Jesus, the Spirit of God, has cleansed you, has washed you, has justified you. And there's that word there, sanctified. To be set apart, to be made clean, to be made holy. You know, it reminds me of the words of Jesus. Jesus is, is about to wash the disciples' feet. He kneels down. It's the Last Supper. It's his last week on the earth. And... Uh, and he, he comes to Peter, and Peter's like, no, no, you're the Lord, you're the teacher, there's no way you're washing my feet, because back in the day, the foot-washing servant was the lowest level of servant in culture. So the, the lowest class thing you can do on the planet in that day was to be the foot-washing servant. That was like where people started. So it was like, hey, have you applied to McDonald's? Everyone can get a job at McDonald's. I, you know, I don't even know if that's a good comparison, but the foot-washing servant was the low of the low. And here's Jesus saying, I'm gonna be a foot washing servant for you, Peter, three years into my ministry. And now Peter really like knows, you know, the goodness of Jesus. And he's like, no way, Lord and teacher, are you gonna do this? And then Jesus said, hey, if I don't wash you, you have no part in me. And he's like, well, in that case, wash all of me. And he's like, Peter, man, like, I gotta teach you a couple of things. And he's like, you're already clean. He said, my word, my words have made you clean, past tense. He's like, the one that is being washed 
just needs their feet washed. You're already clean, but you need to be washed. What was Jesus saying right there? At the, there? You're clean, but you need to be washed. You yourself are already clean, but as you walk through this life, stuff will get on you. It just needs to be washed off because it's not you, but it got on you. You don't need to believe that it's you, but it's not in you. It hasn't possessed you, but it's on you. It needs to be washed off of you. Peter, you're already clean. My words have made you clean. You're saved. You believe in me, but now let me cleanse you. So is it that we've been cleaned or that we're being cleaned? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Good word. Okay. Let's take a look at another one. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7.1. Beloved, let's cleanse ourselves. Wait, wait, wait. Didn't we just read the same author, Paul? In, in, earlier in 1 Corinthians, he says, you, wait, you were this way, now you've been washed? And then in the next book, the same author, the same church, cleanse yourself from all defilement of flesh and spirit. That might challenge some of our theology. I used to believe that, you know, like there's three parts of us, spirit, soul, body, and that when we're born again, it's only one third of us that gets saved. You know, the spirit part. That gets fully saved, gets fully clean, and that's, per- that's the perfect part. But then our soul needs to be renewed and our body will be glorified. It fits in those three boxes, kind of cool. Preach is really good. I used to teach like that. It's still in my online teaching like that. But then I discovered that actually there's defilement of spirit that Paul is always asking us to get rid of. You know, you can actually mix yourself with spiritual darkness too as a believer. The, d- the demonic world doesn't just affect your soul. It affects your spirit and your body. You can get mixed signals from the spirit realm and you can have spiritual mixture. So actually, when, when Hebrews 4.12 teaches, when, 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 when it teaches this in Hebrews 4.12, it says, the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. It divides to the division of spirit, of soul, of body, that actually the preposition there is there all the times. So there's the division of spirit, means the good and bad in spirit realm, the good and bad in the soul, the good and bad in the level of the body. So there's actually, we need to be fully sanctified. First Thessalonians 4 talks about, Paul said, I want you to be fully sanctified in your spirit and soul and body, be fully cleansed. He's talking to believers. So there's actually a journey of cleansing and wholeness that happens throughout our life. We're in a process of growth. I dare you to grow. <laughs> dare to grow. What does dare mean? Dare is like a challenge. Like, if you have the courage, do this. You ever played truth or dare? growing up I know we did in high school and stuff and I always was like the, the stuff that we dared each other was just way out there so I was like you know what I'm just gonna go with truth like dare is way too risky I can't be you know like I'm not even gonna name some of the things you know Paul says that don't even name some of the things you know that you practice in darkness you know don't even name it those games you know uh, praise God but but I dare you to grow up and I, and I want to challenge our thinking because sometimes we, we misunderstand this tension in the Bible because the Bible says, by his stripes, you have been healed, right? So it seems like a past tense work. But then what about when you're still walking out the process of healing? But haven't you been healed? Uh-huh. But you still need healing? Yeah. And there's actually a tension of both. And some people, theologically, they'll do the gymnastics and they'll actually eliminate the majority of the Bible that says there's a process and they'll just say, no, no, no. Just like Paul says in Romans 6, count yourself dead, that's the only reality, and they'll just actually ignore reality. Actually, there's a whole movement, uh, you know, I won't name it, but they basically, w- they would be afraid to name a fact because that wasn't faith. Like, no, I'm not sick, I'm not sick, I'm not sick. It's like, listen, the fact that you're sick doesn't interfere with your faith. Just say, hey, this is illegal, it's gotta go. I know Jesus has finished it, it's being manifested in my life. You don't have to ignore reality to have faith. <laughs> faith doesn't ignore reality. Faith doesn't ignore the fact that you just stumbled, you yelled at people, and then you're claiming, you know what, I'm perfect. I don't sin. That wasn't sin. That's their problem. No, no, no. You made a mess. Humble yourself. Apologize. Clean it up. We're in a growth process. Now, it's not your identity, but it was your action, you know? And so as we change our thinking, it'll change our behavior. So we have to understand this biblically. So I want to paint the tension over and over again that there's an already and not yet in Scripture. And are you healed? Yes. Are you being healed? Yes. The moment you were born again, did the stuff that you dealt with in the past and the trauma and this in childhood, did it all get covered in the blood and healed? Yes. But can it manifest and all of a sudden you're triggered and you have no idea why you're triggered when someone just touches you or says that or does that? It's like, okay, I think there's some more healing. (laughs) Because healing is like a journey. It's like an onion, you know? 
You know, uh, Shreks have, are like an onion. I think I, I heard that somewhere. The, there's layers to an onion and you peel it. Yes, it's still an onion, but you peel it and you get down to the core. And so, yes, you have been healed and you're being healed and it's time to grow up and be healed. <laughs> Because when you're really healed, you'll actually manifest everything like Christ and you won't have a trigger point anymore. You won't be triggered by that person, by what they said. You won't put up a wall. You won't run from that. You'll always have courage because when you're fully like Jesus, you'll actually act like Jesus. So the presence, the fact that you still have some anxiety or this or that or the other is just saying, hey, you know what? You're on a journey. Let's continue to grow. There's no condemnation. You know, there's no condemnation for my two-year-old daughter being two. There's no condemnation for her not driving yet. Actually, I prefer her not to drive yet. So what we do sometimes is we look at places where we haven't grown up yet and then we judge ourselves instead of saying like, hey, I'm not where I need to be. I'm still growing, but I'm not where I was. I'm just not gonna stay stagnant because in the journey of growth, I mean, we'll look at it in a minute. You're either growing or you're dying. There's no in between in the journey of growth. So, 2 Corinthians 7 says, let's cleanse ourselves, beloved. Look at 2 Timothy 2.21. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, now to see what these things are, you have to go back to the context, lots of lists of things. He will be a vessel of honor. If you clean yourself, you'll be an honorable vessel, sanctified. So you will be honorable, you will be sanctified, you will be useful to the master, you will be prepared for every good work. If... You cleanse yourself. If you don't cleanse yourself, wait, but am I doing the work of sanctification? No, Jesus does the work of sanctification, but I actually partner with it and I have to yield to it. I have to surrender to it. He's the potter, I'm the clay, but the clay has to be moldable. You know that there's certain clay that can't be worked with, and so what the potter does is he takes it, he soaks it in water, he sets it aside, and he, he puts moisture on it, and he comes back to it multiple times until the clay is moldable. So it's not just about the potter molding whatever he wants. The clay actually has to be pliable, has to be soaked, it has to be saturated, it has to be willing to flex, has to be willing to be bent. So it's not just this like over sovereignty of God, he's in control of everything, I'm gonna do whatever I want all the time. Actually, God's a father. He doesn't control his children. He doesn't dictate his children. He actually partners with his children. He wants them to grow up. He wants the sons, the children to become heirs and take over his estate and to rule and reign with him. At the end, God is a father and he has children that rule and reign with him. So powerful. So a cleansing and a sanctifying of yourself. Are you picking this up? Okay, so there's a process of sanctification. Let's look at 1 John 3, 3, last verse here in the sanctification. If anyone who has this hope set on him, everyone who has this hope set on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Come on, John, just tell us to us plainly. Is it we purify ourselves or are we pure? Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Yeah. You purify yourself because you're pure. (laughs) You don't purify yourself because you're still sinful. Because you've been made pure, you purify yourself. Because Peter was washed by the washing of water by Jesus' words, Jesus said, let me wash your feet. Peter, you're already cleansed. Let me cleanse you (laughs) already and not yet. Are you seeing this? And you'll see it all over scripture. I just wanted to give a couple examples. Let's look at the one like, am I dead or am I dying? Let's take a look at this one real quick. I mean, look, a couple of famous passages here. Galatians 2.20. Actually, let's start with that Romans one. I like, I like the Romans one. Go back to that Romans 6. Actually, 1 through 11 talks about it. I just pulled out a couple things here. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? So here's someone that's been saved. Like, can you sin? Yes. Should you sin? Absolutely not. That's what verse one says. Verse two, no way by no means. Those who have died to sin. That sounds like past tense. I know a lot of people, they preach, you know what? I've died to sin. I don't live in sin anymore. I can't sin. I do not sin. Have you read 1 John? It says that you cannot sin, <laughs> right? Like, and we have this tension that's built up all throughout scripture. And if you just take one side and you'll misunderstand it and you won't grow. If you take the other side, you'll always beat yourself up because it's never done. But you actually need both to be healthy. One, you'll beat yourself up. The other, you'll live, you know, in denial. (laughs) But you need both. So we have died to sin. How can we live in any longer? And then look at verse six. Our old self was crucified with him. Look at verse 11. In the same way, count yourselves dead. Wait, Paul, which is it? 
Verse two, have died. Verse six, was crucified. Verse 11, consider yourself dead. Count yourself dead. Well, if I died, how could I count myself dead? Well, because that sacrifice is living and it needs to go back on the altar. <laughs> Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, Romans 12, 1 and 2. It's a living sacrifice. It has a tendency to just get off the surrender. Last week, you came and surrendered. And then this week, you just picked it up again. Shoot. We got to offer our bodies again as a living sacrifice. We got to surrender again. How many know surrender is not an instant? It's a journey. It's a lifestyle. How many know repentance isn't an instant? Repentance is a daily renewing and turning. Repentance means... I'm turning around and I'm actually changing my mind. I used to think this, I'm gonna think this. And then when that thought comes, I'm gonna reject that and I'm gonna think this. We live in a constant state of repentance and surrender. So Paul says, count yourself dead, consider yourself dead. Think about it like this. Have, you know, you known someone, I'm not gonna ask if anyone's here because it's definitely not you because you've already been made perfect. Um, but maybe you know someone and they've been so offended by like a, fi- a family member, maybe like a dad, you're like, you know what? You're dead to me. And even though they're alive, they count them as dead and they basically treat them as dead. That's really, how, that's a lot how it is with like your sin. Even though you have the ability to still sin and that the members of your body still maybe are like wanna move towards that, you're like, I count you dead. <laughs> you're dead to me, sin. Yeah. Selfishness, you're dead to me. Ice cream sandwiches, dead to me, you know? <laughs> Doritos, you're dead to me. Somebody better, someone better open up their pantry and start speaking to some, of their, to some of their pantry items. You're dead to me. And then take them out and crush them. And throw them away. And then don't go resurrect them again at the store. Hey, you're dead to me. So even though it's available on aisle 14, it's dead to you. So you as a believer, sin's available to you, but count yourself dead to it. That means you've died to it, now count yourself dead to it. So have you died? Uh Uh-huh. Are you counting yourself dead? Yeah. Are you seeing this? Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. I don't even live anymore. Now it's Christ who lives in me. Look at Galatians 5.24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So have I been crucified? Yes. Have I died? Yes. Do I need to be a living sacrifice and get on the altar every day? Yes. Do I need to carry my cross with me every day? Yes. Why? Because the the cross is the instrument and the altar on which a sacrifice goes. The cross was the altar for the sacrifice. So why does Jesus say, take up your cross? Because you never know what he's gonna ask you to surrender next. Because we're just living dead people. (laughs) The living dead. Are we alive? Uh Uh-huh. Are we dead? Yeah. Have we died? Yeah. Do we need to die? Yeah. (laughs) Are we healed? Yes. Do we need to be healed more? Yes. How do we know when we need to be healed more? Well, when all of a sudden, people around us are like, yo, you're reacting, you're running, You're hiding in fear. That's anxiety. Hey, hello. And then all of a sudden you're like, hey, I'm not digging up the past. I believe Jesus has healed me of the past, but there are some signs and symptoms of my past. I better get to the root because the fruit's nasty. (laughs) Because if you want to uproot the fruit, you got to get to the root. (laughs) If you want to uproot the fruit, you got to get to the root. (laughs) Because the fruit's not about the fruit, it's about the root. (laughs) Jesus said, make the tree good and the fruit will be good. Make the root good. Amen? Amen. Romans 8, 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if by the Spirit you put to death. Here's Paul, a couple chapters later, same audience, same church, same letter. Hey, you died. Hey, put yourself to death. (laughs) Are you getting this? Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. In reference to your former way of life, rid yourself of the old self. Wait, I thought Jesus did that when I, when I repented. Yes, a death process started. Bring it to maturity. A new life process started. Bring it to maturity and put on the new self. So 
you have died, now get rid of the former way of life. Most of the former way of life is no longer in you, but it still has residue in your thoughts and in your attitudes and maybe in your subconscious memories. So we're being renewed in the knowledge of the will of God. It's our, it's our knowing that's being renewed. We've been made new, but sometimes the stuff that's been wired into our subconscious and our memories and our habits and our attitudes and our at- thoughts, that's where it's broken. So as we repent and think right, as we believe right, we'll behave right. As we speak right over ourselves, we're gonna behave right. One of the things that I have been practicing in my life is that uh, instead of struggling with my sin, I started to declare the opposite of who I am in Christ. And I started to do that. And when I started to do that, I started to see victory. I first started to do this. I didn't even know about the principle in the Bible. I hadn't learned it yet. I hadn't analyzed it yet. I first started to do this when I was in college and I was struggling in the area of purity and lust and all that kind of stuff. And I remember going to uh, this like guy's you know, a retreat thing. And there was a big major emphasis there at this conference. And I just remember one of the things that the Lord just highlighted to me was that I needed to actually go in front of the mirror. I needed to look at myself. I needed to get my little sharp finger, point it in the man in the mirror and start to tell him a couple of things. I needed to throw around some nouns and verbs and adjectives at that man. So I started to do that. You young man are a holy man of God. You're a pure man of God. Your eyes only want to look at the Lord. There is nothing evil in you. You've been washed. You've been sanctified. You've been cleansed. You put off that former way of thinking. So I just started to slap that man of God in the mirror and started to call him who he really was, a man of God, rather than like, you stumbled, you're a stumbler. The devil will take what you did and he'll call that your identity. The Lord will take what you did and he'll call you something different. There's a sinner that's brought to him and he says, son, your sins are forgiven. Because he sees that, that sinner as a son and he calls him by name. He doesn't call him by his action, he calls him by his name. Son, your sins are forgiven. Because if he realizes he's a son, he'll stop sinning. Because what you believe about yourself, you'll behave without any effort. So I started to, look at myself and begin to declare some stuff over myself. You know, last year I started to run and before I was just like, I'm gonna run this half marathon and I'm gonna try to beat my buddies. Now I'm like, I'm a runner. There's a difference because now I actually enjoy it. Before I was struggling through it. Now I'm like, I wanna do it for fun. You know, I went running five, five times in a week and my wife's like, babe, is that enough? I'm like, no, I kinda wanna run twice a day now. <laughs> She's like, you're an addict. You know, I'm like, no, that's not who I am. <laughs> but if there's something broken inside me, maybe I better grow up a little bit. But don't call me, don't call me by what I did. Just say, hey, I think there might be some brokenness in you. Let's deal with it. (laughs) Just don't call me that. Amen? Watch what you call yourself and what you allow yourself to be called. Because your words in your mouth have power over your life. Be careful that when you sin, you don't call yourself a sinner. You call yourself a son that's growing unto maturity and is getting freed from sin. Because your mindset will determine your behavior. Amen? What you believe will be how you behave without any effort. Okay, my goodness. Time is getting away from us. I have three points and that was the introduction. Point number one. Oh my goodness, dare to grow. It's time to grow up, Vic. Get through your sermons in 30 minutes, come on. Okay, praise God. That's not who you are, man. You're good with your time. (laughs) Okay, the importance of growth. Number one, the importance of growth. I wanna talk about why growth is important because you'll never do something unless you know it's important. Because if growth is gonna be difficult, if it's gonna take some surrender, it's gonna take some sacrifice, it's gonna take you yielding, then you have to know the why because the why will motivate the what. If you don't know the why, you won't do the what. The importance of growth. Number one, the importance of growth uh, is that growth is essential and it's wired in and it's created to every part of life. Growth is essential. Whatever's not growing is dying. There's a famous quote there uh, used by many people. This might be the originator of it, but when you stop growing, you start dying. When you stop growing, you start dying. There's no cruise control. There's no pause. There's, there's, only, there's only one or the other. And actually, biology shows this. Plants show this. Humans show this, that you're either growing, you're in the right environment, you're actually adding nutrients, adding nutrition, removing waste, and you're growing. Or if you don't add nutrients... You will grow, you'll max out, you'll plateau, and then you'll die. So uh, um, we may or may not look at this, but if you you download the notes, they're gonna be available online. 
I have charts, I have graphs, I have the growth process of the bacteria, I have plants. I mean, it's all kinds of stuff in there. It's a full study. It's like a 30 or 40 page thing with lots of scriptures and study and notes. Check it out. We're just barely getting started with it right here today. But you're getting the idea. You're getting the idea. The goal is not that you got the whole revelation. It's that you're actually obeying and, and yielding to the Lord's direction and correction in your life. Are you letting the Lord father you? Lord, we just ask that you would father us. We're on this journey. We don't wanna stay stuck. Whatever places have been stagnant or stuck, we just declare that they're gonna be, they're gonna be flow. There's gonna be flow in there again. Whatever places have, been, have not had movement, we just declare movement again in Jesus' name. Whatever places that there's people in this room or that, that are watching online have been stagnant in their marriage and their finances and their growth in, in a habit that they've almost adopted a sin habit that has become such a cycle, it's so engraved, they've given up even trying and praying. In Jesus' name, right now, we just ask the, the masseuse and the chiropractor <laughs> to come in and undo those stuck joints and undo those stuck muscles and that we're gonna start to move again. We're gonna start to grow again. We're gonna start to grow up in Jesus' name. So growth is absolutely essential. Jesus thought it so important to grow. You know, God, in his divinity, sovereignty, wisdom, decided to plant Jesus on the earth as a seed, a baby that had to grow. And Jesus actually had to go through a growth process. That's number two, Jesus had to grow. You know that if Jesus had to go through a growth process, how much more we, this was Jesus, sinless, God in the flesh, had to go through a growth process, we need to go through a growth process. Look at this, uh, Luke 2, he continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom. If you ever stop increasing, you start decreasing. There's either increasing or decreasing. There's no, there's no, there, there's no middle. There's no cruise control. I like to see it as like a car that's driving up the hill. If you're, if you're driving up the hill, as long as you're on the accelerator, you're going forward. The moment you let off the accelerator, you're going backwards. You're either adding to the acceleration or you're going backwards. So there's no like, you know what? I've kind of gone into a cruise mode. I'm kind of comfortable. Comfortable means you're dying. In Christianity, in life, when you get comfortable, you're decreasing. Well, you know what? You know, this is just a comfortable week. I'm not gonna go on, and I'm not gonna do any workouts or any runs. This is my rest week. Well, you're actually decreasing that muscle and the gains that you got. Like, I'm on Strava, and there's this, like, fitness tracker, and it actually, you know, every day you're off of it. Like, it drops your points, and you're trying to increase your points, and it's like, you only gotta take, like, two or three days off, and it's like, oh, my goodness, I have to work for a week to get those three days back. You know what I mean? Those that know, you know. Those that don't, you grow. <laughs> in Jesus' name. Jesus had to grow. Luke 2.52 says this, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. So he grew spirit, soul, and body. Look at this other scripture that talks about Jesus' growth. Jesus actually had to learn some things. He was unlearned. Jesus, in, in uh, Hebrews chapter five, verse eight, says, although he was a son, that's his identity, he learned obedience from what he suffered. So suffering produced some growth in him. James says it like this, actually you should rejoice and be happy when you suffer and go through trials because that's your catalyst for growth. Yeah. Sign me up. Suffering, trials, persecution, <laughs> that's, your, that's your catalyst for growth. Let's take a look at this. God expects us to grow. Number three, look at 1 Peter 2.2. 2, 2, 2. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual marks Milk, <laughs> murk, it's murky sometimes. <laughs> Crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up. That's really big there. You know, I don't know how I did that. You know, when the keynote gets imported, like anything that I bolded just gets really big. <laughs> it wasn't like that in my notes, praise God. Grow up! <laughs> I think it's prophetic. <laughs> like a newborn baby, drink the milk and grow up. You know, it would be unusual if my 10-year-old was still drinking from a bottle and asking for milk for every meal. God expects us to grow. First, uh, 2 Peter 3.18, rather you must grow in the grace. You must grow. Must grow. Yeah. Must grow! You know, there it is. Someone say must grow. Must grow. In the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the Bible commands it, it expects it. So is it already finished? Yes. Is it in process? Yes. <laughs> Ephesians 4.15. We are to grow up in all aspects. 
into him. Grow up all aspects of him who is the head that is Christ. Hebrews 6, 1, therefore leaving the elementary things, the elementary teachings about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again the foundation. Now, some people, you look at those six foundations there in Hebrews 6, six foundations, they're like, I have no idea. Wait, the, you know, the, the coming of Christ, the, you know, the, the judgments of Christ, like, teach me about that. Like, we haven't even, he's like, we gotta press on to maturity. There's some, there's some basics. If you haven't learned the basics, maybe you gotta spend a year in KMSM, help you grow. Come on, there's some radical things you might have to do to help you to grow. You might have to do something radical. I mean, we had some married people taking a year off of their life, work, everything to jump in and grow. What are you gonna do? Is it important enough for you or are you, are you happy to stay stuck? You know, last time I spoke, I talked about the difference between just being saved and being, you know, uh, in the kingdom of God or being a disciple of Jesus. And the difference was one just took believing, the other took surrender. Growth takes surrender. Why is growth so important? It's actually connected. It's not connected to your salvation, essentially, but it's connected to your rewards, your place, your entrance into the kingdom, you being a disciple or not. All of these things are connected to growth. So I'm not preaching, even like Jesus, you know, like he was preaching in the crowds and they're like, he was talking about the kingdom of God and he was saying all this stuff and they're like, man, it's really hard to be saved. And he's like, you know, like how does someone get eternal life? Jesus ignores the question, keeps going. And he's like, no, strive to enter the kingdom of God. I, I'm not even gonna talk about salvation. Like, is it really hard to be saved? He was talking about the kingdom. Is it really hard to be saved? That's an aside. He ignores it. Strive to enter the kingdom of God because that is the real destination that we're called to grow up into. We need to press into maturity. If you missed that message, by the way, listen to it, but download the notes because there are so many scriptures. It might mess with you, up your theology, but just make sure it's biblical. So I give you a whole study with all the scriptures. You can check it out. Okay, so number one, growth is essential. It's necessary. It's foundational. B, point two, we're gonna be wrapping this up here because we wanna get to C. C is where the juice is at. But B, go to B, the process of growth. Okay, the process of growth, just like in the natural, you start as an infant and you grow up. Jesus started as an infant, had to grow up. Jesus, even at the age of 12 in the temple, he has to grow up and act more mature, you know, and like, and not, you know, act like that with his mom and dad and like leave them without knowing where he's at. Like there was some growth that needed to happen. It wasn't sin, but it was immaturity. It needed to grow. There's a process of growth. Same in the spiritual. You know that you're born in the spiritual as an infant. That's why we looked at all these scriptures that talk about being an infant. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter three, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual or mature people. I actually had to speak to you as fleshly, as infants in Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 3.1. I had to speak to you as infants in Christ because you're, you're so immature. You're so fleshly. You're so carnal still. So Paul is talking, he's like, to the saints in Corinth, to the sanctified, to the holy ones, to the pure ones, to the cleansed ones, stop acting so fleshly. Stop being so carnal. You're so fleshly still. Wait, so are they saved? Are they saints? Are they, is the work, has the work been finished? Yes. Are they still immature and acting like babies and acting in the flesh? Had to be corrected. You know, the theme for 1 Corinthians, if you could just give it a title, it's called spanking the saints. That's what Paul has to do, all of 1 Corinthians. When I was in high school, we did like a, you know, like a, a theme for every book in the Bible and that was mine, spanking the saints, you know? And he's asked to be like, guys, grow up. Like, I know you're saints. He loved you. He, he died for you. Time to grow up. What are these things in your life that have been stopping you from your growth, from your destiny, from your potential? Look at 1 Corinthians 14. He has to tell him again. He's spanking the saints again. Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children in regard, in regard to evil. Be, be like children, but in your thinking, be adults. What's he challenging them? Their, their thinking is stinking. Their, their stinking thinking, their thinking is stinking because that's where the problem was. Because yes, they were transformed. There was a seed of something put in them, an incorruptible seed. But because of their thinking, it didn't have the environment to grow. You know, a seed has to have the right environment. We won't get into gardening. I used to do gardening. That's a lot of examples. But a seed will just remain a seed, but it has to have the right environment. You know, even bird seed, like I love birds. I love animals. I have like bird feeders in my house. And like when those seeds, they've been sitting in my like some of them I bought a long time ago. They've been sitting in the store, who knows how long. Then they're sitting, they've probably been processed, I don't know. But they're just, they're sitting there for two years 
in my garage, I forget about them. I pull them out, start feeding them to the birds. They're eating the seeds. Some of the seeds fall to the ground. They get watered. All of a sudden, stuff is growing. I'm like, I didn't plant that in my grass. Where is all that coming from? It's because the bird feeder's right there. And underneath the bird feeder, I'm growing all kinds of stuff. <laughs> because the seed was dormant because it was in the wrong environment. It just sat on the shelf for years. It needed the right environment. Can I tell you, maybe your lack of growth, your lack of freedom, your lack of breakthrough has been the environment that you've been in. I dare you to change your environment. Dare to grow. Dare to shift the environment. Dare to shift the environment in your, in your house. Shift the environment of what you listen to. Shift the environment of the music. Shift the environment of the stuff that comes through your, your phone or your TV. You wonder why there's all that negativity in your house while well, your kids are growing up watching it. Where did they learn rebellion to you? They watched it. <laughs> Where did they learn to be ADD? They watched it, you know? The, the scene changed every two seconds because that's the only way we can keep ADD generation entertained. So be careful of the environment. Oh, we got to skip through this. You can check out the notes online in a minute. Um, everything starts as a seed and grows up. Let's just take a look at this real quick. Genesis 2, 17 says this. You know, even death started as a seed. Look at what it says. This is God talking to uh, Adam and Eve in the garden and he's warning them about the one tree that they're not supposed to eat from. And he says, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. On the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, most translations have that phrase, you will certainly die. But if you actually look at the Hebrew there, it literally means dying you will die. And actually there's some translations like Young's literal translation actually writes that in there. Dying thou dost die, because it's kind of an older translation dying, you will die. That's literally what it means. So what's the key here? Because sometimes we actually even get bad theology from this verse because we're like, oh, like the moment Adam and Eve sinned, something died within them. It was their spirit. No, because your spirit's what communes with God. Like humans have a spirit. You know, the Bible even says, I'm going to throw this one in a wrench into your Bible study exploration, that all animals have a spirit that the spirit of God is the breath of God, that every living thing has the breath of God in it. It says that in Ecclesiastes, that if you were to remove his breath, all living things would instantly die. So the plant life has the spirit of God, <laughs> the breath of God, animal life, human life. So when Adam and Eve sinned, their spirit didn't die that day. We're like, oh, and then like we know when we get born again, we get our spirit back. No, I used to misunderstand that and believe that too. No, what he's saying is that the day you eat of it, dying will happen, and eventually you will die. And Jesus calls that second death, eternal destruction, damnation, the lake of fire, right? He said, the sin will kill you, and that'll kill your body and your soul and your spirit. But the main thing is, Jesus said, don't worry about those that can kill the body. Like, that's first death. That doesn't even matter in one sense. Be concerned what happens with second death. Because if you don't eat of the tree of life of Jesus, and receive eternal life, you will experience second death, which is the damnation of a soul. Jesus said, don't worry about those that can kill the body, but the one who can destroy your body and soul in hell. Destroy in hell, right? Like crazy, right? So look at this. The day you eat of it, dying you will die, meaning that a death process will start. So how does death happen? Well, when a baby's born, they're, they're innocent. They're, they're, God loves them. They're innocent. And they grow up. They start to do sin. They eat of the tree. And all of a sudden, death process starts. Now we start to deteriorate. And now we start to die. And we need to be born again. Everyone sins. Everyone goes astray. Everyone needs to be born again. And we are born again. And there's a seed of life that comes in. Are we instantly made perfect? Just no. Just like we didn't instantly die. Adam death entered him, it took him 930 years for that death to turn into physical death. 930 years. That's how long that physical process started. So the seed of death enters in in the same way all throughout scripture, you see that it's seed and then time and then harvest. Same with life. Yes, you've been healed. Yes, you've been saved. Yes, you've been washed. Yes, you've been justified. Let's wash up. <laughs> Let's grow up. Let's slough off all the stuff. Let's put off and put on. Colossians talks about it. Ephesians talks about it. Galatians talks about it. Romans talks about it. Paul is a master at building this tension all throughout scripture. Everything 
starts as a seed. I mean, just look at Jesus' parables. He says so many parables about the seed in Mark chapter four, just as an example. The kingdom of God, what's it like? Like a man scattering seed. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, he doesn't know how. All by itself, the soil, the right environment produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. So the kingdom of God is like what? It starts small as a seed and it grows up. It's, it, the kingdom of God starts small, it's like leaven, but then it leavens the whole loaf. The kingdom of God started when Jesus Christ died and was resurrected and now it's been growing and growing and growing. And guess what? Can I tell you? Darkness is not winning. The kingdom of God is growing faster than darkness. Is darkness getting darker? Yeah. Darkness is really good at that. Stuff festers in darkness. But watch where you put your attention. The world is not getting darker and darker. L look at the statistics of the number of people getting saved. Just Muslims per day, 30,000 Muslims per day are getting saved and converting to Christianity. Because the kingdom of God started with Jesus. And it's been growing and growing. Jesus said, the kingdom of God, it's like a seed that'll keep growing. It's like the mustard seed. It's the smallest seed in, in, in the garden, but it grows up and it becomes the biggest tree. Even the prophecy in Daniel, it says that in the end, there's, there's, there's gonna come this rock and it's gonna grow and it's gonna take over. And the mountain of God is gonna grow and become the pr most prominent mountain. Over and over, the rocks, the seeds, the mountains, all of them speak of from little to big. God is growing us up and we're supposed to take dominion and authority on the earth, amen? Okay, now let's get into the best part, C, ABCs. We're just gonna get to, just talking about the ABCs here. Grow up, a little bit of milk, how to grow. I wanna give you guys a few things and I think this is like the practical part because how many know that there's an element where God's responsible for the growth? If you watch through scripture and even sanctification, it's a work of the Holy Spirit in like 10 scriptures, but then it's also a work of you in another like 10 scriptures. So almost the equal amount of scriptures that give the work of sanctification to the Lord, it also gives the work of sanctification to you. So both are true. So how do you grow? Well, number one, let's just realize it's not by our own strength, but let's first yield to God. Number one, we need to grow and receive God's grace to grow. We need to receive God's grace to grow. Say, I receive God's grace. I'm not gonna do it in my strength. I'm gonna receive the grace of God. I receive the grace of God. For some of you, you need to stop striving and just receive more grace. You need to be a, just a really good receiver. Some of you, you've been having trouble loving, but actually the problem is not you loving, the problem is you're not getting enough love, so you're not giving it, because you can't give what you don't have. Some of you, you know, you've been trying so hard not to be angry, but actually you just need to feel forgiven and accepted and then you won't be angry. It'll be easy for you to be forgive, forgive. Some of you, you know, the issue is not that you can't forgive. It's that you don't realize you've been forgiven and you need to experience that. First and foremost in the kingdom, we're receivers before we're ever givers. We love because he first loved us. We give because he first gave to us. Everything we have, everything that's good in us is of Him. And so we need to plant ourselves into the soil of just receiving. Uh, receive God's grace. Check it out in, in, in 1 Corinthians 3, 6 and 7. It says, I planted the seed. This is Paul talking. Apollos watered the seed, but it was God that made it grow. Can I tell you the growth is from God? Say, the growth is from God. I yield to the grace that flows to me to grow. I yield to the grace. I receive grace. Father, right now, we just release grace. Your word says that, you, that, that actually scripture can impart grace to the hearer. So as we've we been as we basking ourselves in the truth of your word, let grace flow to the hearers right now. God, whatever we haven't had grace for, let grace flow to now. Whatever places that we've needed, needed help in, we release grace. We release grace for work. We release grace for healing. We release grace for finances. We release grace for freedom from sin, for freedom from shame freedom from anger, freedom from impurity, lust. We release grace for that. It's not through striving, it's through the grace of God. And so we just acknowledge, Lord, it's by your grace and we just drink of your grace. Just taking a deep breath of the grace of God. Whew. Feel that? We just release peace to you right now. Let grace and peace be multiplied to you right now. Just taking another deep breath and just get another dose of grace. 
we release grace to you to live like Jesus. Grace to be free from that thing that's been haunting you. Not grace for the other person to change, but grace for you to be different. Some of us, we've been asking for grace for our partner or our spouse or our kid, and we're the ones that need the grace. Thank you, Lord. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 24. The one who calls you is faithful, and he's gonna do it. Can I tell you, this is a promise of God. He called you, and he's faithful, and he will do it. Some, so, sometimes we think that he called me, I have to do it. That's not what scripture says. He called you, he will do it. His will, his bill. Where he guides, he provides. <laughs> Woo! Where he leads, he feeds. He doesn't lead and then you feed. He doesn't guide and then you provide. He doesn't will and then you bill. No. He wills and he bills. He's faithful, he will do it. So we just receive that. We receive the grace that you're doing it. You're doing a work and we yield to it. We just get on that cross, we get on that surrender, and we say, yes, have your way. It hurts so good, let it hurt. <laughs> and give me some good anesthetic called joy. <laughs> you know, every time God wants to do surgery, he gives you anesthetic, it's joy. <laughs> it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. He doesn't do surgery without anesthetic. He's like, you know what? I'm gonna take some stuff out of you, but I'm gonna give you joy. The, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Jesus was able to endure the cross because of joy. You know, I watched my incredible wife birth our baby in a pool, in a bath, in a, you know, pool, inflatable in our home. And uh, it was painful. But when she started to feel and see the joy, the bundle of joy that was coming, it was like, I wanna do that again. That's a lot of pain. They say that man has never experienced that kind of pain that the women experience in, in childbirth. I don't know. I mean, have you ever been sick, guys? You know, it's cold? Yeah, exactly. About the same. Just kidding. <laughs> but for the joy set before you, you're like, sign me up for the endure. You know, someone has a kid once and they're like, you know, that was so painful, I'm never having a kid again. But you don't see that. You see moms that just get addicted to having more kids. <laughs> I mean, my wife was the, the baby of 13 kids. Talk about the joy set before you. You'll endure. So he gives us joy and he's going to do it. I just feel like this is where the Lord really wants to minister today. I'm going to read a couple more scriptures. Philippians 1, 6. Be confident of this. He who began a good work in you, he's going to carry it out onto completion all the way until the day of Jesus Christ. That's the day Jesus returns. That's the, all the way till the day. He started it. He will do it. So just yield to it. Sometimes the Lord can't do it because your hands are on it. He can't do it while you're doing it. Let him do it. Just yield. Jesus, take the wheel. He can't take the wheel when you're sitting behind the driver's seat. For Jesus to take the wheel, you got to painfully park the car, crawl out, go to the other side, slam the door, and just follow. <laughs> and say, Jesus, take the wheel. Now he'll take it because you're not sitting in the seat. Here, Jesus, you know, provide for me. Working 80 hours, you know. Here, Jesus, provide for me. I don't even trust you. Like, I can't even, like, really give or be generous or tithe because I, I can't trust you. But, like, provide for me, Lord. Provide for me here 80 hours more. That's not Jesus taking the wheel. His way is like, you know what? Give even when you don't even have it. Because there's one that withholds and they just, they decrease more. And then there's one who gives and they just increase and increase, right? He's gonna do it. I love this one, Philippians 2.13. It is God at work in you. Both to desire and to work. You might be like, you know what? I don't even have a desire. I have good news for you. God works even to your desire. He will give you 
the desires for your heart. <laughs> That's another way you could actually translate and interpret that. Like, if you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires to desire so that all of them can be true. Because when your desires are his desires, you have them. Just delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires. So we just release desire to you. You haven't even had a desire. You've been hurt. You've been offended. You've given up hope. But desire's coming back to you. This is a work of the Lord. So can we just yield to the grace of the Lord for our growth? I think the most important thing in all of this, I now have like five more after this. But it's a dead battery, you know? But it's also alive. <laughs> dead battery. I got like five more after this. I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I might mention them. I might not. But grow in the grace. Receive the grace. He called you. He will do it. What things have you been put, putting your hands on and you haven't been trusting him? Has it been in your finances that you haven't been trusting him? The evidence that you don't trust is that you don't even like trust him that, that when you're generous and when you tithe and when you give, that actually you'll have enough. You're like, I have to, I got myself into this debt. I have to crawl out. Repent of that garbage thought. He says, you got yourself into that? Let me pay for it to come out. That's what a good father does. You know what a good father does? Their kids get themselves into a problem and they go rescue them. A good father does that. There's times where it's like, you know, you let your kid kind of stay in that mess for a bit until they ask for help. But when they ask for help, you can't help but help. <laughs> Dad, like, I'm stuck. Help. And I, I just, you know, the, the, last night, this morning, I was just prepping. And then here's my daughter, Emmy, just like asking for stuff. And I just, I stop, I put it down. Okay, Emmy, let me go help you find that toy. Because, and if we being evil know how to give good gifts, how much more the Father? When we stop, we repent, we ask for help. Can I just, can I dare you to repent? Dare to repent. Dare to grow. Dare to humble yourself. Dare to plant yourself in the right community. Dare to get yourself into the right rhythms. Amen. Dare to receive the grace of God. Dare to not do it on your own. Dare to walk in the grace. Be strong in the grace. Can you just go to that slide that has all six of them? I'm not going to go through any of the scriptures, but just put all six of them, how to grow up there just for fun. So you guys can be tempted to download the notes later when they're up but receive the grace of God. Number two, the word of God. There's like 15 scriptures that talk about the word of God helps you to grow. You know that like even, um, ah, we can't get into it. There's no time. Check out the notes. They're awesome. <laughs> stay in community and stay open. You can't grow in isolation. An isolated person, they always come to destruction. Growth, you can't see your own blind spots. You need community. You need to confess your brokenness one to another that you may be healed. You know what another way to grow is to be selflessly serving others. You know what they say to people that are depressed? Go out there and do something nice for somebody else because all you're thinking about is you. One of the first things you do to someone that's depressed and anxious is you go and get them to serve and do something greater than them, outside of them, to someone else. Sometimes we're not growing because we're still selfish. We're thinking about ourselves. Can I tell you, my greatest season of growth was when I wasn't ready yet, but I was given a small group of guys that were falling apart. I was like 19 years old and I had a bunch of 15, 16, and 17 year olds in high school. I'm just a couple, maybe two years ahead of them. And they're barely saved. They're not saved. They think they're saved. They're acting like the devil. And I'm like, I gotta help these guys grow. Guess what that made me do? Grow up. Responsibility for someone else's growth is the best thing to get you to grow up. They say that when, 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 a, when, when a man has kids, it'll either force them to run away if they're really broken or it'll force them to grow up. Responsibility for others matures you. And then surrender to God. How do you grow? Surrender. You gotta give up to go up. We gotta, we gotta get rid of that sin and guilt and shame. Uh, Hebrews 12, one says, let us lay aside every weight and the things that so easily entangle us. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin. There's things that hinder that aren't sin. Let's throw off those things that hinder. Maybe that relationship, maybe that environment, maybe that, I don't know, those decision makings. They're not sin, but they're hindering you. Go back to number six. And then the last one is responding to correction, both from the father and from others. You wanna grow? 
sign up and ask people, you know what, where do you see an area of growth for my life? Sign up and ask someone. One of the most humble things you can do is be like, hey, is there anything that you see in my life that, that needs correcting? Are there any blind spots you see? It takes humility to ask to be corrected. I mean, you can tell when someone doesn't have any humility to be corrected when you correct them and they're like, no, what are you talking about? You're, you're the problem. Even when you give them correction, they don't receive it. But it's another thing to not only receive correction, but to ask for it. You wanna grow? Well, ask for a coach. What's the coach gonna do? He's gonna correct everything, you know? If I get a running coach, they correct how I run, how I walk, how I breathe, everything. <laughs> how I eat, how I sleep, how I train. The reason you get a coach is because you want them to correct everything that's out of alignment. So how do you grow? A few things right here. So I just wanna open up some worship and I wanna open up the altars a, a bit. If you need to grow, grow. If you, I mean, if you need to go, go. If you wanna grow, grow. <laughs> Can we stand up to our feet? I just want you to ask the Holy Spirit. Ask the Lord. Lord, what is it that you're fathering me in my life right now that you're asking me to grow up in? Maybe there's a lot of things that came up, but what's the one thing, Lord, that you're pointing out in my life right now that you're asking me to grow up in, that you're asking me to release, that you're asking me to do? Maybe it's a rhythm. Maybe you haven't been in the word and the way you grow is by the, the pure milk of the word. And God's asking you, hey, will you revive that rhythm? Will you no matter what, at least read a chapter a day to keep the devil away? <laughs> Well, you know, no matter what, I don't care how late it is. I don't care how early it is. Just get in the word. Some of us, I don't, I don't know what it is for you. We just got to get back to some old fashioned. Lord, I just need your presence. I need to actually pray with my spouse every day. You know, one of the things that the Lord corrected my wife and I on is that we had our own prayer times where we, we stopped praying together. And so a couple weeks ago through a friend, because correction will often come through the Lord, but it'll often come through a friend. Like, hey, I feel like you guys are supposed to pray together again. And having to skip the day, we take at least 10 minutes and out loud, we just, we pray together. We pray in the spirit. We pray for one another. We pray whatever is on God's heart. But maybe you need to do that. I, I, it's one of, one of the most refreshing rhythms in the last two weeks in my life has been to just take my spouse by the hand and pray together. Can I tell you, you can't be angry at each other and praying for each other at the same time. You can't, like, it'll build intimacy in your life. Like, what, what is the Lord asking you? I just gave you a couple instances where the Lord's been fathering me. Another place where the Lord's fathering me is in the area of my emotions, and I'm receiving grace to live differently. Not only that, but I've actually even been seeing a pastor friend that's been helping me walk through some stuff because I thought I was healed. I thought my theology was like, I'm healed once and for all. I don't need to go back. But it's like, man, there's some stuff early on in my life that it's like, I just need to get healed. So I'm actually going, and I'm growing. And I'm saying that to say that what is the Father asking you that you haven't yielded to? Let's yield together to this journey. All of Christianity is about growth. And so, and actually, it's encouraging. It's fun. It's awesome. So, Father, we just thank you. We love you. If you need grace released to you, you want someone to partner with you in prayer, we're going to have our ministry team that's going to be available here to pray. If you want to just come forward and worship, you want to receive prayer, we're just going to open it up. We're just going to go into worship. Go pick up your kids, maybe have them come back, but let's just do that. Let's just worship the Lord. Father, we just thank you. We worship you. We love you. Again, if you want to come out and get ministry for anything, our ministry team is going to be out here. I'll invite them to just come up now. You need a word of encouragement. You need God to break something off of you. You need to respond to God. You need to confess something. You know what? I've been dealing with this. Will you pray grace over me? But will you humble yourself today? And we have an incredible ministry team, some awesome pastors and leaders. I'm gonna invite more of them to just come. Just come. Come on. Don't lose your moment. This is an opportunity. Respond now. Yeah, you're gonna respond this week. You're gonna shift some things, but respond now. Respond now to, to the fathering of God. Let's let the Lord father us. Let's let him correct us. Let's let him guide us. We yield to you, Father. You're a good Father.
There's grace being released to you today. There's grace being released to you. There's grace that's going to flow to you today. Scripture says this, that God gives grace to the humble. You know what humble? You know what humility looks like? You know what being humble looks like? It's coming and saying, you know what? I've been stuck. I've been in this sin. I've been in this shame. I've been in this cycle. I'm done with it. Will you pray for me? I want to open up and I want to receive grace and prayer. Can I tell you, I bet on the other side of your humility is some grace flowing to your life. On the other side of your humility, that you just come and just confess and just receive that. I'm gonna invite more of our ministry team to come up. If you're part of our leadership team, our second year students, whatever, just come up. I believe that there's grace being flowing to you today. And part of the way grace flows is it flows to the places where you humble yourself and you open yourself up to walk in the light. Maybe you haven't told someone in a while about your struggle. You need to today. And you need to just open that up and then have them pray for you and then just receive grace. So we just really, we release fresh oil and fresh grace to flow in Jesus' name. And I'll stand with arms and heart up. inviting you to do something today about your breakthrough, about your growth, about your journey, will you come and just receive fresh grace? May the love of God flow to you. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ flow to you. Whatever things maybe are even ashamed of, there's no shame in family. There's no shame 
There's no shame in your past. It's not who you are. You've already been made clean by the Word of God. Now we wash off of your feet these things that you've been walking in and have been on you, have gotten on you. We just wash that off of you in Jesus' name. You're already clean, but we wash you again. Be washed. Be cleansed. Lord, we come against darkness. We come against the spirit of death, suicidal things, God. We come against, God, anxiety and depression, thoughts of suicide. In Jesus' name, there's some of you in this room that you've been even afraid to say that you've had thoughts of suicide. Get that off your chest. Humble yourself. It's okay to be attacked. Just don't walk in the attack alone. There's nothing wrong with you because you're attacked. Even Jesus was tempted with everything and he was without sin. So your temptation doesn't define you. Your temptation is not who you are. So whatever those things that have been on you, just let someone wash them off of you. You know, Peter couldn't wash himself. Jesus had to come and wash his feet. You can't wash your own feet. You gotta have a brother or sister come and just wash your feet for you. So whatever things have gotten on you, they're not you. You've already been saved, you've been washed, you've been cleansed, but stuff needs to get washed off of you. There's some pain that's been in your life that needs to be washed off of you. There's some despair that needs to go. Would you come and just receive the washing of water by the Word of God, by our brothers and sisters, by moms and dads in this place by brothers and sisters that'll come and just wash you. They'll just wash you with words of life. They'll wash you with words of wholeness and healing. As you confess your faults and your sins and your issues one to another, that you may receive healing, that you may be healed. So we just open this place up as a place of freedom. I open your life group up to be a place of freedom this week that you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna share with your leaders you're gonna share with your group what you've been going through you're not gonna walk in anymore you're gonna be free I just release courage to you in Jesus name to be free I release the courage of God for you to face the difficult things for you to face those things that God's been asking you to face for you to obey the Lord where he's been nudging you to obey so we just release you to yield to the Father in Jesus' name. Yield to the Father. Yield to His love. Yield to His grace. Yield to His washing. Let Him wash you. Let you be like Peter and let the Lord be like Jesus. I've already cleansed you. You're already clean. My words have made you clean, but I wash your feet. I wash your feet. I wash off of you guilt. I wash off of you disappointment. I wash off of you wounds from other people. I wash off of you those arrows that have been shot at you from others. I remove those scars and those the pain and those arrows that have come against you. I remove those fiery darts. I wash you. I declare over you, be washed, be whole, be clean. I wash off of you those words that were said over you by a mom or a dad, by a leader, by a pastor, by a spiritual authority. Words that are not the words that Jesus would say. I wash that off of you. That you're too much. Something's wrong with you. You're not going to amount to anything. You're a failure. I wash that off of you. You've been washed and you're saved, but I wash trauma off of you in Jesus' name. I wash pain off of you. Let the Father just wash you. Even to the level of your subconscious thoughts and feelings and memories, I declare you're washed by the blood of the Lamb, by the washing of water of the Word of God, by the Father's love. Be washed by the Father's love.
be washed by the hands of your maker. He takes it off of you. He takes that weight off of you. He takes that worry off of you right now. even open it up and if you're in the room and you feel like you want to minister to your neighbor or pray over them or speak life over them remember that words of prophecy are for the encouragement for the edification for the comfort for the strengthening so I just even open up the room if you want to just minister to one another love on one another we'll do that feel free to go at any time we've officially ended our service we've dismissed if you want to talk can take it out to the lobby if you want to just stay in this atmosphere minister to someone minister to the lord let's just linger for a couple more minutes i just sense that there's some people that are still lingering here that the lord wants to actually wash some stuff off of you and i feel like he's going to use some of those that are in this room you'll even open yourself up to someone and just allow them to speak life over you but that's not who you are Jesus. Thank you for joining Kingdom Movement Online. I pray and hope that that sermon impacted you deeply. I would love if you shared this with a few friends and family. And before you go, don't forget to subscribe. See you next week.